We have some questions that came in advance. So we'll start by uh, working on those. And I would encourage you all to continue to put your questions into the chat box. So Jesse, I think uh, the first couple of questions are for you. The first is a question from a grantee. Can a cost be considered coronavirus related even if we were already planning to do that activity? For example, if we plan to provide a public service grant to a nonprofit serving elders to conduct on-site computer literacy classes, but the organization pivots to bringing food to seniors so that they can shelter in place, is that okay? Thanks for the question, Marian. Um, in general, CDBGCV is for funding activities that prepare for, prevent, or respond to the coronavirus. So you can't automatically do activities you previously planned and assume that they meet the new CARES Act requirement. On the specific activity you asked about, you're serving the same population and the activity type is still public services, but it sounds as if the nature of the specific activity is different. You're running classes versus home delivery of food. For an entitlement, this should be a substantial amendment because citizens should be informed about how they may be affected and how they can benefit and participate. The new activity is, re is related to preparing for preventing and responding to the pandemic. Public service is the eligible activity. The national objective is presumed LMI benefit um, under the limited clientele requirements. So it's very doable, but I think you, you have five days of citizen participation ahead of you. Great, thank you. The next question relates to the provision of rental assistance. If the financial impacts of COVID drag on for many months, will HUD consider extending the six month period allowed for making rental assistance and other emergency payments on a household's behalf? Gosh, we just made this waiver. Um, HUD is interested in hearing from grantees and stakeholders, and we will be closely watching as the grantees set up activities and as funds are expended. We encourage grantees strongly to stay in contact with their field offices and share local experiences and needs. On this, personally, I would ask, has the grantee created a coordinated funding strategy for rental assistance that accounts for our Available CARES Act and state and local funding sources? It might be helpful to consider where the CBG CV CBG funding fits into the range of funding sources that will address rental assistance needs and help set a family up for longer term resilience. Terrific. Uh, the next question is about income eligibility. When looking at a family's income, do we need to factor in unemployment insurance payments? Um, well, Hunt's working on responding to this question consistently across programs. The um, FAQs, the Q&A for um, public housing authorities, EHA has about um, and been updated. The formula programs on community planning and development and CDCV are part of that are Q&A coming. However, um, I'd also like to mention that there's a range of moderate income benefit documentation options, um, presumed benefit, nature and location, um, and so in the CBG regulations already, that might, that might mean that you don't have to do individual income for every activity. So definitely want to talk to your field office, read the regs, talk to your field offices about that. But questions, um, they're numbered OC24 and OC25 on the most recent um, uh, FAQs posted by public housing on the HUD.gov's COVID page. So if you go to HUD's COVID page, HUD.gov's COVID page, which kind of insists on being paid attention to if you go to HUD.gov, and then jump to um, public housing, um, they have some FAQs posted on that page. So question 24 says, are the new $1,200 stimulus payments um, considered annual income? And the answer to that is no, because they're temporary and non-recurring. Um, and then 25 covers the three different kinds of unemployment benefits. Um, and it asks, should, should PHAs cover regular unemployment benefits as income or um, unemployment from the CARES Act? And um, regular unemployment benefits will continue to be considered income. They are considered income now. 
Um, so that's going to continue. The Section 2102, which is EUA, um, Pandemic Unemployment Assistance, um, is included. Um, it's a it's a expanded benefit that is essentially unemployment insurance. Um, Section 2104, which is the SPUC, uh, Federal Pandemic Unemployment Compensation, most people know it as the $600 a week. That is excluded because it's temporary and, you know, at this point, non-recurring, likely non-recurring. And then the Section 2107, which is the PEUC, or Pandemic Emergency Unemployment Compensation Program, so you thought there was just one, but there's all of these. Um, it allows a regular unemployment compensation to receive up to an additional 13 weeks of benefits, and that, because it's regular, is included. And we'll be getting our q and as soon as we can. Great. I'm sure grantees will be looking forward to seeing yeah. that in writing since it's such a complex answer to such a simple question. Well, the next thing is that public housing has it out. It is public housing specific, but they do cover all the different kinds of income and the the, um, the reasoning. Terrific. Thank you. Um, so a question about the public service cap. Is it removed only for... Um, the use of funds that are directly responding to preparing or preventing uh, the coronavirus. So is it also a question, to put it another way, is it that public service cap available for fiscal year 19 and fiscal year 20 funds that are not coronavirus or related? Well, let's look at it the other way. Build your stack the other way. You can build up to 15% with activities that are not pandemic related. But anything that is more than 15% has to be prepare, prevent, respond in the regular grants for 19 and 20. Okay, thank you. But I mean, that's the way I would do it. Mary and I have a running joke about math, guys. <laughs> okay, so um, I think we're seeing that we need some clarification around um, the state use of their funding for entitlement versus non-entitlements. Could you just yeah. talk through that rule again? Um, well, what the CARES Act did was um, it said that the um, population of the second allocation that was just to states could be used throughout the state regardless of entitlement status. And so that amount, because grantees are not getting, you know, just because there's three allocations, they're getting one grant. But the amount of the second and third allocations can be used throughout the state as if the state was um, an entitlement. And probably the model to think about is an urban county. Um, urban counties have a lot of local governments signed up and, you know, with them. Um, and they sometimes subgrant to the local governments and the local governments carrying out activities, and sometimes the urban county just acts directly. Um, for example, if they're building water and sewer or something, and or they're doing a service that crosses boundaries, they'll offer it um, throughout the urban county. And what we did was enable states to, to act that same way. So if an urban county is to give funds to, you know, provide benefit inside an entitlement, um, there. You know, if they and they do it through an amendment instead of an action plan, there's no consultation requirement. Consultation is probably still a smart idea to make sure that there's no duplication of benefits, that the entitlement isn't trying to fund the exact same thing the state. Thank you. And we do have some duplication of benefits questions we'll get to. Uh, but first, I wanted to ask about the expedited citizen participation procedures. Yes. So. We know that the public comment period has been reduced to five days. Does that apply to any fiscal year 19 or fiscal year 20 funds, or does that only apply if the um, amendment or substantial amendment, uh, excuse me, the substantial amendment um, is being used for coronavirus? <laughs> Give me a second. I got a cough. Sorry about that. 
make James answer it. James, I had to throw you in there. My my tick went off and I started coughing. <coughs> the answer is, if the grantee submits with an amendment or a, an action plan that include, it includes a coronavirus funding component, then that action plan or amendment benefits from the, um, the streamlining and can move ahead with uh, the five days. Now, there are some other waivers that were granted in April 2nd, and the notice talks about it. So there's much, there's a great deal of additional streamlining available, for example, to ESG that even goes beyond ours, but it was statutory and came in the CARES Act. So this is one where make a phone call if you're a grantee, make a phone call to your field office, let them know what's going to be in your amendment, make your proposed amendment, and just meet our plan and make sure that you have the right number of dates. Okay, thank you, Jesse. Um, a grantee would like to confirm that operating costs for homeless shelters are an eligible expense regardless of the program also receiving ESG funding to respond to coronavirus. No, we're seeing some combinations um, of funding, but you want to make sure, again, that you're not paying for the same things. Um, and uh, so you have to patient of benefits between ESG and CDBG, CD, or regular. Um, but it isn't impossible if you have the unmet need or the identified need. We don't actually call it unmet need on the non-disaster side. Um, you also need to, to watch out with shelters, of course, you know, some jurisdictions have FEMA, PA funds moving, public assistance funds moving. Some are using some of their Treasury Community Relief Fund. Um, there's a lot of private philanthropy moving around um, homeless shelters right now, so you know it's a it's a a thing. You have to be really strategic about which funding sources you're using and make sure they don't overlap. But we didn't create a a band that they've used together ever. You just have to meet the program requirements for both programs. Okay. Um, we have a question about duplication of benefits. Are we required to assure that CDBG CV is the payer of last resort? We have other programs in the community with rent and mortgage assistance. We are currently referring all applications that meet their income guidelines. You're not required to be the payer of last resort. That's what we it means when we're throwing around that term order of assistance and that there is no order of assistance requirement. But because CDBG CV funds are flexible beyond most of the other funds in play here, um, you know, you want to you wanna try to use, just strategically, not as a requirement, you want to try to use single purpose funds for that single purpose before you put something that could be used for multiple things in there most of the time. So. You know, it sounds like you've picked a, a good um, program design. You know, use the single purpose funds that'll pay rental assistance before you move with some, you know, your money that could also be off doing something else like small business assistance. And I know this is an issue that will be explored further when you do your duplication of benefits um, guidance yeah. and webinar and what the grantees need to do to ensure that their policies and their procedures are in place to prevent duplication of benefits if they do want to take the chance, if they want right. to provide funding, even knowing that there are other um, related community programs available given the scope of the need. Right, and I don't see it as taking a chance, right? Because with a formula block grant like CWG or with the treasury funds, which are essentially a block grant, um, those funds aren't for that purpose until you commit them for that purpose. So what you're looking for is our funds committed for the purpose that you're already committed for the purpose that you're you're diving in for, and you know that makes them available. Um, you know if you have an organization that's committed to cover costs but they haven't raised the funds yet, come talk to your field office and we'll talk to you about that. But but look for the funds that are that are committed or nailed down some way and are really you know on their way in, 
look for applications that are in that have a good chance of getting, um, like FEMA public assistance, a good chance of getting funded, and and move around that really carefully. A lot of the other funding sources seem to have match requirements that we're seeing, and CDBG CV can be used for match requirements if the activity is the you know, other activity is um, otherwise eligible. So, you know, there's a there's a lot of um, if you do the smart thinking up front with your program design and steer out of the way of other funds, um, you're going to have far, far fewer problems on the back end. Okay. I think we have a, another sort of duplication of benefits question. For eligible activities and the criteria associated with no other funding available, we've launched a temporary rental housing assistance program and funded it at $20 million dollars but we're seeing a greater need than can be addressed by the $20 million. Can we supplement with CDBG CV2? CDBG CV2 is state funding. Um, this is an un, 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 unusual question, I guess. Um, we think of it as all one grant, right? So I'm not thinking of each allocation. You can amend your action plan and add more funds to an activity um, and go through a quick amendment of your amendment you submitted by amendment or amendment of your plan, um, so long as you still have grant funds. You have to make those those tough local choices as a grantee. I'm, I'm not really sure how else to get at that question, but you, you can, if you've run out of money from the source that was paying and you still have need, that's how, that's, you know, that's how you do duplication of benefits. You figure that out, that there's still need. So another question from a state. Does CV2 have to have its own set aside for non-entitlement, or can states satisfy uh, their non-entitlement allocation using uh, just CV1? We're, once the allocations are made, it's all one grant. There isn't, HUD isn't, Separating them. When you get a grant agreement for your CDBG CV, um, it's just going to show a total amount. It isn't going to say this much for CV1 and this much for CV2. What the notice says is of the total amount you end up getting, you're going to have to set aside um, and, you know, an amount equal to the first allocation for non-entitlement. It doesn't tell you that it has to be, you know, your first dollar or your last dollar. It just says that out of the, the total grant funds that you get, one, two, and three, the one grant you get, you have to use, there's a set aside of an amount equal to the first allocation for non-entitlements for their use. And here's a nuance on that. The non-entitlement could come back to the state and say, you are running a small business program. Will you administer my amount or, you know, for me, we went out to our citizens, we want to do small business, but we can't stand a program up that fast for it. You're running one already. Will you spend this in our jurisdiction? And they can enter into an agreement and do that. And this is a, a way of thinking about this happens in urban counties all the time, right? So it is, this is, this is the analogy, and this is what we're trying to set up, is that states could function that way if non-entitlements come to them. Thank you. Um, could you please speak a little bit more about the type of documentation you're looking for to support the urgent need criteria? Um, yes. I mean, uh, the notice actually just lists what the criteria are that have to be responded to by the records that you keep. And it tells you what record you have to keep for each of the criteria. And um, you have to document that you have, um, Marion, could you slide back to that slide or is that, are we? Yep. That'd be great. I want to use the right words. I, I tend to talk to myself in the shorthand. Um, so these are the criteria. So you have to have a record that shows that you have um, an existing condition to respond to. 
and document that your activity is responding to it. We said that you can just document this by the activity is to pre prevent, prepare for, or respond to coronavirus. You have to keep that documentation for every activity anyway. So, you know, that, that one piece of, that one dot piece of narrative documentation takes care of both um, requirements, um, urgent need and the CARES Act requirement. Criterion two, do you have a condition that poses serious, oops, serious, an immediate threat to the health or welfare of the community that is of recent origin or recently became urgent? And we said, just give us your public health emergency declaration, your federal disaster declaration, your state local emergency declaration, you know, with a date on it. And that's your documentation. So you don't have to create a new piece of paper. You just got to put that in the file for this activity. And then the third criterion is, um, are you unable advance the activity on, on its own, or are other sources of funds not available to carry out the activity? And HUD said that because we can see that um, local and state governments are straining um, because of the pandemic everywhere in the country, that we would simply allow, again, that this is documented by the activities being to prevent, prepare for, or respond to coronavirus. So this, the same paperwork handles criterion uh, Three as handles criterion one as handles your CARES Act eligibility. Thank you for clarifying. Our our city is the utilities provider. Are the emergency payments of eligible persons utilities still an eligible activity? So I think that's an arm's length question that's being asked. Can we essentially yeah. make a payment to the city itself on behalf of an individual? And I have been in webinars saying that I have concerns about that, and I'm sure people are aware about um, publicly, fully publicly owned utilities um, and the arm's length issue. And it, we don't have an answer back on yet that yet. We are working on a Q&A. But it's very similar, like, Policy-wise, to can you pay yourself for an, a land acquisition? And the answer is usually no. So we are, you know, we, we're going to set the framework for, you know, if you're a private utility and, and publicly regulated, you know, this is those are usually fine. If you're quasi-public, that's the case we're still sorting out. But if you're fully publicly owned, I think we're going to have some arms like issues. Um, with making utility payments, and we're still stepping through that. So that's a great example of something you'll want to check back on the website to look yep. for updates. Um, so, Jesse, I promised you I would answer a couple of the DOB questions, the duplication of benefits questions myself, so I'll take this one. Is oh. it duplication of benefits if, for example, a church pays for April and May rent? and CDBG pays for June and July rent. No, that does not present a duplication because the total amount of assistance received by the person isn't greater than the cost. So that's a clear-cut example of layering of funds rather than creation of a duplication. Uh, question about reporting. Do we report CDBG CV in the 2019 CAPER? That's a good question. I doubt they'll have any accomplishments yet, but um, and we've extended the 2019 capers, but we did get some grantees who um, picked up their grants in like May, really fast. Robert, are you here? Are you able to unmute? We have our IDIS expert, but I'm not sure we can get in. We may have to take that question up um, later, Marion. Okay, fair enough. <coughs> a robust uh, list of questions coming in from the attendees. Yep. For rental assistance programs, what are examples of appropriate forms of documentation to ask for subrecipients or beneficiaries to submit to establish the tie back to coronavirus? And again, it's how do you document tie back to coronavirus? Yes, particularly for a rental assistance program. What's the appropriate form of documentation? Um, 
It's going to vary. It's probably going to be um, a narrative, and you're going to have to um, also maybe build some stuff into your, your policies for the program. Um, in most communities, the, um, the rental assistance needs, um, you know, kicked in as the emergency declarations happened and um, for, for the kind of rental assistance that we've been talking about so far today where you're trying to keep people from getting evicted, um, they kicked in, you know, relatively late. So you would say, you know, what is the sequence of events in your community? What is driving people out? And then you're going to say how you're going to check that each household is having, you know, some kind of economic disruption or some kind of issue related to the CARES Act that's causing them, you know, not to, not to be able to pay their rent. That's one way to do it. If the purpose of your public service, because you're making emergency payments for a reason, if the purpose is just to keep people from getting off the, you know, getting on, you know, evicted, um, so that they won't be on the streets during a pandemic while you have a health emergency, then you would document that they were at risk, and you can you can borrow from um, from other programs, but that would be a possibility. The other kind of rental assistance we're seeing is not related to eviction issues. It is related to overcrowding, where there are people who are um, essential workers and get exposed and don't have any place to go to quarantine themselves that wouldn't expose their people at home. And there are some rental payment programs that are um, we're getting some questions about. I don't know if any of lunch to pay for um, uh, places for those people to um, go to quarantine themselves rather than. Um, taking a potential exposure into an overcrowded situation. Okay, Jesse, really appreciate you taking all these questions. Just a few more left before we wrap up. Okay. Um, this is a question from a grantee who has many low-income households whose children are not able to attend school at home because they don't have Wi-Fi. And they're asking whether broadband services could be considered eligible as LOMOD area benefit, LMA, provided that the census tract or block would be eligible under the usual formula allocation? Well, it depends on what sense that, I mean, there is a path through to yes on that. Um, so if you were, for example, to go hire the, um, the truck that usually does broadband Wi-Fi at, uh, say, I don't know, Burning Man or something, some big, you know, concert venue, they don't have any business right now. And park it in the middle of your Loma neighborhood and blast out broadband to a Loma neighborhood. You know, go team. Um, it you know prevents people from getting losing their jobs and it hooks everybody up, children, seniors, everybody. If you are talking about digging in the ground to do broadband now, I'm not sure you go fast enough. If you're talking about paying individual household subscriptions to um, broadband or providing equipment as part of a public service to connect low and moderate income households. That's going to be a little bit tougher on an area of benefit basis, but we can talk about it. It's more likely that you would go through an income certification path, household by household, because you're going to be paying subscriptions for household by household. Okay, great. If we are utilizing CDBG CV funding for economic assistance and to microenterprise under the LMI national objective, but we also want to provide economic assistance to businesses under, need, under the urgent need national objective to have more reach, is that acceptable? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think it's a bad idea to set up um, – an activity and say um, that it could meet either LOMA national objective or need and describe the criteria there. Just remember, you have to hit that 70% mark for your grant. Um, that urgent need is, is available. It's used incredibly rarely in the main program, and I think that's why you're getting so many um, how do you do it questions. Um, 
So I think I'm sort of flagging in my mind we're going to need to add a, a little bit of a guide on this or, you know, do a little bit more work around technical assistance on urgent needs. But, yes, it's possible. Thank you. And it's, it's great to have the back and forth um, and hear about the grantee needs so that you can establish your future guidance. Exactly. Let me just give you one more hard one, um, and after you finish, we'll turn it back to Jelani. It's a question about reimbursement. Yeah. How can we go back to January for reimbursement of activities if we didn't conduct an environmental re review before then? If we have yeah. environmental clearance for a public service um, type program now, uh, can we request reimbursement for staff salaries back in March? Yeah, so what happens is that you, back in January, you, you didn't think you were getting federal funding. So that, that opens the ability to move forward with this. And then Congress put wrote reimbursement into the CARES Act. The, the bottom line answer is you cannot commit funding or expend funding. Don't incur the cost. Um, don't commit it. Funding for an activity before you do the environmental review. And then um, we provided um, some technical assistance already on how to go forward. And um, the environmental review team is also going to be providing additional. TA, but the big, big thing is don't go paying it or committing it before you um, complete your environmental review. So entities should look for future yeah, sure. guidance right. on, on environmental flexibilities. And then the, the question raises a different point, and that is you cannot pay general conduct to government expenses and make up your lost revenue general operating revenue with CDBG CV. That's not eligible and not on the table. Um, so general conduct of government is still, so to the extent you're paying staff costs when they were working on things that are eligible activities for CDBG CV or putting together your um, CDBG CV amendment or a plan and doing citizen participation and all of that, Things that are pre-award costs that may be outside the time frame for pre-award, things like that. Those are all going to be fine. You just need to, you know, get all the way through the environmental review before you commit the fund, the CB fund. Okay, thank you so much, Jesse. I'll turn it back to Jelani. Thank you, Marion. Thanks so much, Marion, and thanks to Jesse and James for the great presentation today. That, include, that concludes our webinar. Um, please uh, remember that the slides and the recording of today's session will be available on HUD Exchange in the coming days. Um, please also remember that if we weren't able to get to your question today, that uh, you can reach out to your field office and also uh, leverage the resources provided by uh, HUD to, to help uh, you and all other grantees get the information that you need. Uh, thanks for everyone's uh, participation today, and thanks for all the important work that you're doing in your communities. Have a great day.